Hello and welcome to this tutorial on change of accounting date. My name is Debbie Bray, um, a tutor with LexisNexis, and I'm going to be taking you through the change of accounting date rules. Now, this is applicable for those of you who are studying ATT Paper 2, and it's one of those areas that students tend to find hard. So what I'm going to do is start by reminding you of the rules, and then we're going to go through two different examples that apply all of the possible rules you could see in an exam question. OK, so in front of you are the rules that we're going to talk through. First of all, the steps for dealing with change in accounting dates. The very first thing that you need to do, and this is probably the most important step, is to identify the tax year of change. If you get this wrong, then everything you do from here on in is wrong. Now, the tax year of change is always the earlier of two events. It's the earlier of one, the first tax year that accounts are not prepared to the old accounting date. So this is the first time they're not prepared to the old date. And we compare that to the first tax year when accounts are prepared to a new date. Whichever is earlier is the tax year of change. And what we're going to see is that often they will give you the same tax year. But occasionally they don't, and when they don't, it's the earlier of the two. That's the bit that's difficult, because after that, you treat the tax year either side of the tax year of change in the normal way. In other words, you always tax 12 months up to the accounting period that ends in that relevant tax year. Once you've done that, you'll find that you've got a period of time that hasn't yet been taxed. And that's relevant for step three. That's what we call the gap. Now, the gap will never be exactly 12 months long. It can't be because of the nature of changing your accounting date. So you'll either end up with a scenario where this gap, these months that haven't yet been taxed, are more than 12 months. Where this is the case, you tax the whole of the gap, but then you try and reduce what you're taxing down to 12 months by using unrelieved overlap profits. Alternatively, you'll find that the gap is less than 12 months long. That's not enough because in this tax year, you will have traded for a full 12 months, so we have to end up taxing 12 months of profit. And what we do, we create further overlap profits because we tax 12 months back from the end of the gap. Now, it's much easier to understand this by looking at an example. So let's start by looking at, first of all, a sole trader called Trevor. Now, for Trevor, I'm going to give you various accounting periods and his tax-adjusted profits. And by that, I mean we've done all of the adjustments. We've deducted capital allowances. These are the fully tax-adjusted profits for each accounting period. So he prepares accounts originally for the 30th of June each year. So for the year ended, the 30th of June 2008, we are told that he has got tax-adjusted profits of £54,000. For the year ended the 30th of June 2009, his fully tax-adjusted profits are £60,000. He then decides to change his accounting date, and the next set of accounts he prepares end on the 31st of December. And he decides to do an 18-month set of accounts, ending on the 31st of December, 2010. And his tax adjusted profits for that 18 month period are £72,000. Now he's changed his date to December, he'll prepare accounts each year to December. So the next accounting period will be the 31st of December 2011. And we're told, let's say, that the tax adjusted profits for that year to December 2011 are £45,000. Now the other pieces of information I will give you, let's say that Trevor had some overlap profits from the opening years of trade, and let's say that his overlap profits were £36,000. Now, I'm going to tell you how many months that relates to. In this case, it's nine months. But remember, the way that you can always work out how many months must have been taxed twice in the opening years Remember, he used to prepare accounts to June. And if you count forward in time from the 30th of June to the following 5th 
of April, that will give you the number of months that have been taxed twice. So July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. We ignore those five days in April, and that gives us nine months. And I count those on my fingers. Okay, now before we start applying these rules, I'm going to set up a timeline because I find it helpful to see the information that's going on on a timeline. You don't have to do this, but if you haven't done so before and you struggle with this topic, you might find it helpful to try. So, first of all then, we started in the information with a year ending the 30th of June 2008. I'm not on the timeline going to bother putting the tax adjusted profits, I'm just going to put the accounting period ends. The next accounting period was to the 30th of June 2009. Then we had the 18 months to the 31st of December 2010, and the year ended the 31st of December 2011. I'm going to leave a bit of space under the timeline. You'll see why as we go along, and I'm going to go through those steps that we talked through at the start dealing with this change in accounting date. So step number one. I need to identify the tax year of change. Now, we said the tax year of change is always the earlier of two events. So it's the earlier of, first of all, the first time that we have no old accounting period end. So looking at my timeline, he used to prepare accounts for June. The first time he doesn't prepare accounts to June is the 30th of June, 2010. Now, that date, the 30th of June, 2010, which tax year does that fall into? Well, it falls into the tax year 2010-11. I'm going to compare that with the first time he prepares accounts to the new accounting period end. And again, I can quite clearly see from my timeline that the first time he prepares accounts to December is the period to the 31st of December 2010. So that date, the 31st of December 2010, in this case also falls into the tax year 2010-11. And therefore it's fairly obvious that our tax year of change will be 2010-11. As mentioned earlier, often it is the same. So step two, we're going to tax on a current year basis either side of 2010-11. So, what is the tax year before 2010-11? Well, that's going to be 2009-10. Looking at my timeline, which accounting period ends between the 6th of April 2009 and the 5th of April 2010? And the answer is this one. The year ended the 30th of June 2009. So we're going to tax this year end in 2009-2010. And if you're doing the timeline approach, you might find it helpful to draw on the timeline what you have assessed in that tax year. But in either case, I'm going to jot it down as well. So in 09-10, on a current year basis, we've taxed the year ended the 30th of June 2009. Okay, so that's the tax year before 2010-11. The tax year after 2010-11 will be 2011-12. So again, on a current year basis, we're going to identify which accounting period ends between the 6th of April 2011 and the 5th of April 2012, and it's going to be this one here. The year ended the 31st of December 2011. So again, on my timeline, I'll show that in 2011-12, we will have assessed the year ended the 31st of December 2011. And again, I'll jot that down in words. Now, if you're not using the timeline option, when you write it down in words, what you might find helpful is to just put in brackets when that year ended the 31st of December 2011 started. You might think, well, that's obvious but it's not always going to be a December year end, so you might just find that helpful. Because step three, we need to identify now the gap, those months that have not yet been taxed. And that's why I find the timeline really useful, 
because I can straight away see that the bit that hasn't been taxed is this bit here. Now, in this case, my gap relates to one accounting period. Don't be put off. It could relate to two accounting periods, but in this case, it's just one. So in this case, our gap is the 18 months ended the 31st of December 2010. So, jot that down. Our gap is the 18 months ended the 31st of December 2010. Now, we've been given the tax-adjusted profits for this. The tax-adjusted profits for that 18-month period are £72,000. So, we're going to start by putting that into our workings. But, this gap is more than 12 months long. So, what we've got to try and do is reduce what we're assessing in 2010-11 down to 12 months and we do that by deducting overlap relief. Now, if we can deduct six months' worth of unrelieved overlap, that will effectively bring what we're taxing down to 12 months in this tax year. So how on earth do I deduct six months' worth of unrelieved overlap profits? Well, going back to the information I gave you, the overlap profits amounted to £36,000. But a very important piece of information is that that related to nine months that were taxed twice. So I don't want to relieve all of this £36,000 of overlap profits. I only want to relieve six ninths of them. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be deducting six months of the nine months of unrelieved overlap profits that Trevor had. So six ninths multiplied by £36,000 means we're going to be relieving £24,000 of those unrelieved overlap profits in the tax year of change to give him a trading income assessment in 2010-11 of £48,000. And it's this figure here that we would then take to his income tax comp. Watch out. This could be tested as a short form question. It could be part of a long question for sole traders or for partnerships. If you're specifically asked, well, what will be the unrelieved overlap profits to carry forward, there will normally be at least half a mark, if not a mark, going for that calculation. So that's the easy bit. In our case, then, the unrelieved overlap profits to carry forward we started with original unrelieved overlap profits of £36,000, and that related to nine months, remember, that had been taxed twice in the opening years. From that, we're going to deduct what we have used in 2010-11, on the change of accounting date, we've used £24,000. In other words, we've had tax relief for £24,000 of those unrelieved overlap profits because we've relieved six months' worth. So to carry forward, the amount of overlap profits that we have are £12,000, which relates to three months that are now deemed to have been taxed twice. And Trevor will either get relief for these on a future change in accounting date, or more likely, he'll get relief for these when he ceases to trade in that final tax year of trade. OK, so hopefully that's all clear. It does take quite a long time. And I accept that when you're dealing with a long question, by the time you get to this stage, particularly if you've done your add backs and your adjustments to profit, if you've had to also calculate your capital allowances, you may well be slightly running out of time. So for those of you who want an alternative way of doing this quickly, I'm going to give you an alternative suggestion. And if you're going to use this alternative suggestion, then please do draw up the timeline. In this case, we're going to start again by putting all of the accounting periods on the timeline. So the year to June 08, the year to June 2009, the 18 months, 
to the 31st of December 2010, and the year ended the 31st of December 2011. And then what we're going to do is we're going to identify the tax year that each accounting period ends in. So starting with the first one, the year ended the 30th of June 08. Which tax year does the 30th of June 08 fall into? It falls into 0809. The year to the 30th of June 09, the 30th of June 09 falls into the tax year 0910. The 18 months to the 31st of December 2010, that date, the last day of that period, the 31st of December 2010, falls into the tax year 1011. And the next accounting period, the year to December 2011, 31st of December 2011, falls into 1112. So in this case, we've got one accounting period that ends in each of those tax years. So now let's look at how long each of those accounting periods are. Well, the first one, the year to June 08, is obviously 12 months. So on a current year basis, we are going to assess the year ended the 30th of June 08 in that tax year, and that's it. Nice and easy. The same applies to the year ended the 30th of June 09. It's a 12-month accounting period. So on a current year basis, we will just assess that one year end in 0910. However, when we come to look at the 18 months to the 31st of December 2010, that's odd. That's more than 12 months. Therefore, this is our tax year of change. Because this is our tax year of change, and we've only got the one accounting period that ends in this tax year of change, we're going to tax the whole of the 18 months to the 31st of December 2010. And then we're going to deduct six months worth of unreleased overlap profit. And then finally, just to make sure we haven't made a mistake somewhere along the line, if we have a look at the next accounting period, it's the year ended the 31st of December 2011. So that's again just one 12-month accounting period ending in 11-12, and therefore we're back to our current year basis again. So that you might find helpful. If you didn't find that helpful, stick to the, the full step-by-step -step approach we started with. Okay, so that's Trevor. And looking back at our steps, we identified the tax year of change. We looked at the profits that would be assessed in each tax year before and after the tax year of change. We identified the gap. And in Trevor's case, the gap was 18 months. 18 months is more than 12 months, and so what we did, we reduced the gap to 12 months by using unrelieved overlap. Okay, so let's look at the other scenario then. So this time we're going to look at a different sole trader. This time we're going to look at Barry. So information about Barry then. He used to prepare his accounts to October each year. And for the year ended, the 31st of October 2009, Barry's tax-adjusted profits are £30,000. For the year ended, the 31st of October 2010, his tax-adjusted profits are £36,000. He then decides to change his accounting date, and he prepares accounts for the 18 months to the 30th of April. 2012. And the tax adjusted profits there are £60,000. Thereafter, he prepares accounts to April each year, and so for the year ended the 30th of April 2013, his tax adjusted profits are £20,000. Again, I'll give you his unrelieved overlap profits from the opening years of trade. So his unrelieved overlap profits this time, let's say, are 9000 286 pounds, and that's going to relate to five months that were taxed twice in the opening years of trade. How do I know it's five months? Well, because he used to prepare accounts to the 31st of October. If I count forward in time from the 31st of October through to the following 5th of April, so I'm going to use my fingers here, November, December, January, February, March. 
that gives me my five months. So again, I'm going to use the timeline approach. You don't have to. It's entirely up to you. So for Barry then, on his timeline, I'll put all the details of his accounting periods. So we start with the year ended, the 31st of October 2009. He then had a year end of the 31st of October 2010, an 18 month period to the 30th of April 2012, and the year end the 30th of April 2013. Now some of you are probably looking at this and thinking, I know, the tax year has changed, the gap is just going to be this 18 months to the 30th of April 2012, because that's the odd one. And that's why we picked this information, because you're going to see that that isn't the case. So let's go through step by step. First of all, as before, we're going to identify the tax year of change. So the tax year of change is the earlier of. First of all, when did we not have the old accounting period end? So the first time he didn't prepare accounts to the 31st of October. And looking at my timeline, I can see that he didn't prepare accounts to the 31st of October to the 31st of October 2011. That date, the 31st of October 2011, falls into the tax year 2011-12. I'll compare that to the first time he prepares accounts to the new accounting period end. So his new accounting period is to April. The first time he prepares accounts to April is for the period to the 30th of April 2012. That date, the 30th of April 2012, falls into the tax year 2012-13. So this is one of those situations where the two are different. Where they're different, we take the earlier of the two. And in this case, therefore, the tax year of change is going to be 2011-12. So once we've got that right, we just carry on following through the steps. So step two, either side of that tax year, so either side of 2011-12, we're going to tax on a current year basis. So the tax year before 2011-12 will be 2010-11. And on a current year basis, we used to prepare accounts to the 31st of October and between the 6th of April 2010 and the 5th of April 2011 ends this one. The year ended the 31st of October 2010. And so that's what we're going to be assessing in our tax year 2010-11. And so I'll jot that down on my timeline if I'm using a timeline. And I'll just make a note of it here as well. You don't have to do both. It's, to be honest, it's whichever you find easier. But for the examiner's point of view, I would write it down because that helps them see what you were doing just in case you make a mistake. Okay, the tax year after 2011-12 is 2012-13. Again, on a current year basis, which accounting period ends between the 6th of April 2012 and the 6th, 5th of April 2013. And be careful, it's this one. The 18 months ended the 30th of April 2012. Now hang on a second, this is a current year basis. This isn't the tax year of change. So we should only be using our normal rules. Well, remember when you looked at your opening year rules, where you have an accounting period that ends in a tax year and it's more than 12 months long, do you remember, we just assess 12 months to the end of the accounting period. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back in time 12 months. And when we go back in time 12 months, the easiest way of thinking about it is to say, well, what's the day after the 30th of April? It's going to be the 1st of May. So we're going to go back to the 1st of May 2011. And that's what we're going to be assessing in 2012-13. So let me jot that down. We're going to be assessing from the 1st of May 2011 
to the 30th of April 2012. And if you had to do the numbers for this, then be careful because you'll actually be taxing <coughs> 12 eighteenths of the tax adjusted profits for this accounting period for the 18 months to the 30th of April 2012. And if I look back, the tax adjusted profits for that 18 month period were £60,000. So you'd be calculating 12 eighteenths of £60,000. Okay, so as before, what we're now going to do, step three, is identify the gap. What haven't we yet taxed? So looking at the timeline, the bit that we haven't yet taxed is going to be from, and I'll do it in a different highlighter colour, it's going to be from the 1st of November 2010 through to the 1st of May 2011. So that's going to be November 2010, December 2010, and then January, February, March, April 2011. In other words, this gap is only six months long. Let's jot that down in words. And if you haven't done the timeline, you could still work out the gap by simply saying, well, what's the day after this one? The day after the 31st of October 2010 is going to be the 1st of November 2010. And we're going to assess all the way up to the start of this one, i.e. we're going to assess all the way up to the 30th of April 2011. In other words, six months. Now, remember, what do we do where the gap is less than 12 months? Well, let's go back to the rules. Where the gap is less than six months, we increase what we're taxing to 12 months by taxing profits from the previous accounting period again. In other words, we tax 12 months from the end of the gap, i.e. the end of our gap is the 30th of April 2011, and we're going to go back 12 months to the 1st of May 2010. And this bit here, from the 1st of May 2010 to the 31st of October 2010, is going to involve creating further overlap profits. So let's do the numbers. This is a tricky one. Okay, so this six-month period here, from the 1st of November 2010 through to the 30th of April 2011. This six-month period, a part of the 18 months to the 30th of April 2012. So we're going to calculate 6 eighteenths of the tax-adjusted profits for the period to April 2012, which we've already identified as £60,000. So 6 eighteenths of £60,000 gives us a figure of £20,000 to go into our calculations. In addition to that, we're going to be going back to the 1st of May 2010 and taxing six months from the 1st of May 2010 through to the 31st of October 2010. To do the numbers for this, that's six months of a year end. So it's going to be six twelfths of the £36,000 tax adjusted profits for the year to October 2010. And six twelfths of £36,000 is going to give me another £18,000 of tax adjusted profits. So in total, we are going to have £38,000 of tax-adjusted profits, and that's going to be our trading income for the tax year of change, which is 2011-12.
Again, if you're specifically asked to calculate the unrelieved overlap profits to carry forward, even if you're getting bogged down and you're getting stuck, make up a figure for what's happened in the tax year of change so that you can carry on and demonstrate what the unrelieved overlap profits are to carry forward, because in an exam, you have to be given carry forward marks. So the unrelieved overlap profits that we were given to start with in the question, we were told that the original unrelieved overlap profits were £9,286 and that they related to five months. So £9,286, and that was for five months that had been taxed twice. On this change in accounting date, we've created further unrelieved overlap profits. This period here has been taxed twice. So we've created another six months' worth of unrelieved overlap profits. Let's add that. So in 2011-12, we've created a further £18,000 of unrelieved overlap relating to six months that have been taxed twice. So in total, to carry forward, we now have 27,286 pounds of unrelieved overlap profits, and that relates to 11 months that have been taxed twice. And just to prove that, that the idea behind working out the number of months of overlap always works, look back at the information we've got for Barry. He now prepares accounts to the 30th of April. So if we count forward in time from the 30th of April through to the following 5th of April, that's going to be May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. And we don't care about those five days in April. That is 11 months. Okay, this was a very difficult one. This is as hard as anything you'll ever see. Again, it does take a long time. Let's just have a look at how you could have done this without going through that blow-by-blow -blow step, i.e., could we just have done that information on the timeline and worked it out from the timeline? Let me show you. So, Put the information on the timeline again. He started with a year end of the 31st of October 2009. He then had a year end of the 31st of October 2010. He then had an 18 month period, and it was the 18 months to the 30th of April 2012. And the year ended the 30th of April 2013. So as we did before, starting with the first accounting period, the 31st of October 09 falls into the tax year 0910. The 31st of October 2010 falls into the tax year 1011. The 30th of April 2012, be careful, the 6th of April before that date is the 6th of April 2012. So we're looking at the tax year 1213, and then the 30th of April 2013 falls into the tax year 1314. Now looking at this, I'm missing a tax year. Where is the tax year for 1112? And that's the one thing you have to be careful of when you're using this method, that you might have a tax year that's missing. And where you have a tax year that's missing in the middle, that is going to be your tax year of change. So, my tax year of change is going to be 2011-12. So that I know that on a current year basis for 09-10, we're going to assess the year ended the 31st of October 09. On a current year basis in 2010-11, we're going to assess the year ended the 31st of October 2010. In 2012-13, watch out, we have got an 18-month period here, but we're just going to assess the 12 months to the accounting period end, to the 30th of April 2012. So as we said before, we're going to go back 12 months 
from the 30th of April 2012, which takes us back to the 1st of May 2011, and that is what we're going to assess in 2012-13. And in 13-14, again, it's just our normal current year basis, the year ended the 30th of April 2013. So, what is our gap? Which months here have not yet been taxed? It's going to be these months here, i.e. the bit that hasn't yet been taxed, the gap, is going to be from the 1st of November 2010 through to the 30th of April 2011. Now that is only six months, November, December, January, February, March, April. So what we're then going to do, we are going to go back another six months. And the easiest way of thinking about it is you're actually going to go back 12 months from the end of the gap. So our gap ends on the 30th of April 2011. So we're going to go back to the 1st of May 2010. And it's this period here that we're going to assess in the tax year of change 2011-12. I hope that this has helped your understanding with change of accounting date. The best way of dealing with it is lots and lots of question practice, but from an exam point of view, do not get too bogged down by it. And if you're getting bogged down, guess a number. It doesn't matter what it is, just guess a number, put it down on the page, and keep going. The worst thing you can do is spend ages on this and then not finish the exam. The very best of luck.